this is almost right where I want to start tonight. I, uh, I prayed about it and um, I wanted to kind of uh, pull back away from uh, Ephesians, uh, where we are on Sunday night, and uh, we are going to be in Ephesians 6 when we gather back together. That'll be exciting. Um, but let's deal with uh, what I wasn't able to get out this morning, and that is the issue of the seed, speaking of which, uh, here's mine up here, here is mine up here. It was an ER doctor, Dr. Chuck Thurston, that um, we were at a conference together for Southwest Radio. And um, I, that's where I first met him. And he had uh, heard of uh, me through Southwest Radio and he um, had uh, heard of the, the numbering things in the Bible and so on and he liked it. And uh, so we were doing a conference together somewhere I think it might have been Gettysburg, Pennsylvania. I think it's where it was. And um, so anyway, he got to share in his knowledge of... It. He was the one who introduced to me the idea that the human cell uh, is, is exactly like the, the wilderness tabernacle. And I thought about that for a minute and I went, oh, you're, you're right. And um, so we were sitting there at the dinner table and um, we were just we were just sharing ideas back and forth. He was he was very well aware of the of the medical end of it, the science part of it. Uh, but I was a numbers guy and I was telling him that that, you know, hey, hey uh, uh, Dr. Chuck, these numbers that you're saying, I don't know if you're aware of this or not, but here's what those numbers mean in the Bible. And I mentioned, um, you know, the idea of the, the 23 chromosome pairs, I said, or the 46 chromosome pairs. I said, you know, that's the exact number of words that, um, that um, Adam said concerning Eve, his wife. And this shall, uh, uh, I can't, can't remember it, but anyway, he thought about that and he said, that is, that's really good. And I said, you, you understand then that that's the combination of them together forming the flesh, a, a new body. The two of them shall become flesh. And, that, and that's not just a metaphor of the Bible. It means exactly that. And so we had a good time with it. And then um, after a while, I was able to, to sort of put this down on paper. And, and since that time, and I want to say that's been around... Oh, I don't know. I've, I guess I've known this since about 2005, 2006, somewhere around in there, um, of the idea of seed and what it represents in the Bible and, um, and, and exactly what the Bible is talking about when it refers to the good seed um, or the corrupt seed or the evil seed, the bad seed. When you have the wheat, you have the tares also, and what they all represent. And uh, I guess it's that study uh, introduced to me by this medical doctor that really got my interest and it got me uh, to study more of the human cell. And there's still things about it I don't know. I, some, some of it, if I go to Wikipedia, Wikipedia loves to write scientific articles on scientific things that only science people know. You cannot read a scientific article from Wikipedia and go, oh, I get that, that is so easy. Now they do have a feature now uh, that AI in, will inject in it and you can hit this button and it'll say, would you like AI to explain this uh, like it was explaining it to a 10 year old? Well, so far I've not used that because it offends me. <laughs> I'm not a 10 year old, but I have no idea what it's talking about. So maybe I need, maybe I need to swallow that pride. Uh, anyway, let's go to the Lord in prayer 
and I appreciate you being here tonight. You pray for me, and uh, like I said, I don't know if it's the weather or what, but man, I am hurting today. Uh, maybe it's going around, and other people are hurting as well, so just pray. Uh, Father, we ask your blessings now upon your word tonight. We do thank you, Lord. We value your word uh, because of the things, Father, in this day and age that we know. The things we know about life, the things we know about living, the things we understand now about seed and uh, good seed versus bad seed. And we know, Father, uh, what that is and what it isn't. And Father, we just rejoice in it uh, because these are things, Lord, that people have studied all their lives in days gone by, never really understanding uh, the full extent of what it was that they were studying. But Father, you, you promised us that as the last days would approach, that knowledge would increase, and it certainly has. And the things that we see now relation in relation to the Bible and its relation to the Word and its relation to the human body or the body of, of birds and beasts and, and fish and four footed creatures and all kinds of creatures father we we understand uh the meaning of a lot of things that our forefathers just did not they did not have the knowledge the the tools the science like we have today and father we can't boast on that because we didn't do it uh, this was all you're doing it's according to your master plan and father we just give you praise and we thank you lord for causing us to understand a little bit more uh, in our lives and in our minds and hearts, Father, about good seed versus bad seed, what they are, what the difference is between them, what they will what they will produce, and Father, we just uh, we just are glad to know these things and thankful God that you allowed us to live in a time where uh, these things can be made known to us. And when we look back on them, we find out just how easy it was for us to understand this. But that's because uh, a lot of faithful people stood by this word, stood by this book a long time before they ever really understood exactly what it, what it truly meant and what it truly re represented. And so, Father, we just thank you, Lord, for their steadfastness, their love for your word. Give us teaching, Lord. Give us understanding uh, on the lesson tonight and help us, dear God, to to see uh, the, the bad seed and to know from whence it comes and and how to get rid of it and how to stand against it. So, Father, open up our eyes and help us to see wondrous things out of thy law. We pray this in Jesus name and all of God's people said, amen. Now, uh, I, I mentioned this on the third day of creation. This is the day that God, um, that God gave to the earth seed. He, he introduced seed to the earth. Now understand that day three is the first day. And I, correct me if I'm wrong on this. Day three is the first day that any life shows up on the earth. Am I right in that? In day one, there's no life. There just is light. The earth was without form and void. It was void of life. We know that. Day two, God divided the waters above from the waters below, the firmament. And the evening one in the morning were the second day. Can you think of anything that God created on day two that had life? And I'm waiting for answers because I, I, I just, I don't know, I just thought about this just, just now and I think it's relevant. Okay, day three then is the first day that God introduces living things into this universe. Now here's what's interesting. It was three words that Jesus spoke to Lazarus and made him come out of the tomb alive in better shape than he ever had been before. He said, 
Lazarus, come forth. And the Bible says, he that was dead came forth. Just three words was all it took. But those three words from the mouth of the master can give life to something that had been dead a long time. And that, to me, that always blesses my heart. It does. Um, and, I, you know, I, I keep bringing that story up of me picking up that body. That, that event of me helping retrieve this person who had died, uh, I think God wanted me there. I do. Because I can put... I can put Lazarus now in, in relation to this, this poor man who had no family, no one to care after him. He was living alone in this trailer court and his neighbors, after the fourth day, they started smelling something coming out of that house. It was a single wide trailer. And after them knocking on the door dozens of times, they heard the, the, the same light had been on for days. Um, the, uh, the TV was on and it was never shut off. So then they finally called the law. And Jefferson County's finest came out there. And he must have known who Robert was. And uh, I remember him saying, unless you find a gun, a knife, or a bomb somewhere under there, I don't want to know about it. Because he didn't want to have to go in there and investigate that. He just wanted it to be put down as like a natural cause thing, and I think that's eventually what it was. Um, but I, I felt bad for that poor man. He had, he had no body to tend to him or to look after him. And when he passed on, no one knew it for four whole days. No one knew it. And finally his neighbors figured something out, something had gone wrong. But anyway, um, so when, when, I, when I think in relation to that story of Lazarus, how long he had been uh, dead and how long this man had been dead, I, I know the... I know how the body is at that stage, and it's not good. It is, it's very, very bad. And the point in, the, in this is this. You, it's what I said this morning. You're never too dead for God to bring you back to life. Some of you may be too alive. You may be too good for God to do any, any great work in your life, but you are never, ever so dead that you can't be put back to life. My goodness, the, the dry bones that Ezekiel saw. How long had those bones laid in that field? Years. Years. Hundreds of years, maybe. And yet, he prophesied once. The bones came together. He prophesied again. And then they stood up and they lived. And it, it was just as simple as that. And so, we understand then that the seed... Of the word of God gives life. And so on day three of creation is when God introduces life to this planet. Um, I'm just going to throw this out here. Do you think it's possible that... God could have put on Mars or someplace like that some living little cell thing on a planet that is a hundred light years away from the earth, a million light years away. It doesn't matter. We're not going to get there. Do you think it's possible that God could have Done something like that. Yes, ma'am. He's God. We know that everything that God created was for his 
glory was for his purpose, for his enjoyment. Is that what you said? For his enjoyment. And I, I, would, I, I would say, why, why couldn't God do something like that? Now, having said that, you guys know my position. The earth is the center of everything that God is doing uh, with, with the creation and uh, with the purpose of him creating life on this earth. That is eventually he's going to create man. And the purpose of him creating man is to create and have a woman that voluntarily and willingly yields herself over to be the wife of the Son of God. Because when God said it is not good that the man should be alone. I remember years ago studying that and I thought, you know what? If Adam is Christ, and he is, uh, then why not, why not it be that God created a bride uh, for his only begotten son from the people of this world, and she be a bride that um, willfully and willingly Wants to be the bride of God's only begotten son, Jesus Christ. Okay, that's what I believe. Uh, I believe that when God said that to Adam, I believe that he also applied it to his only begotten son. It is not good that the man should be alone. I will make an help meet for him. And uh, he causes a wound in Adam's side. That wound is similar to Christ's wound in his side. And from that wound, he brings, uh, he takes a rib and brings forth, uh, he fashions it in the form of a woman and brings her to Adam. And when Adam wakes up, uh, God brought her to him. And that's when Adam says what he says. Uh, there, therefore shall a man leave his father and his mother shall cleave to his wife. and They too shall be one flesh. And so anyway, I, I just, I, I don't know, it, I, I, won't, I won't allow uh, anybody else's presuppositions about what they think uh, the Bible prohibits. I don't see the Bible prohibiting any kind of small-celled living organism from being somewhere out on some planet somewhere. I don't, I don't see the Bible prohibiting that. So what, one of the things I'm saying is, is that if, if science comes out tomorrow and says, this fell down to earth, we know where it came from, it, it has living organisms in it, they are alive right now, and they had to have come from some faraway planet somewhere. I won't let that ruin my faith in the word of God. I won't do it. I just, I think God is God, like, you, like we said. God certainly has a right to do what he wants to with his creation. It is his creation. Amen? So, um, let's see here. Let's read this, uh, Genesis 1, 9 through 13. And God said, let the waters under the heaven be gathered together into one place. Let the dry land appear, and it was so. And God called the dry land earth, and the gathering together of the waters called he seas. God saw that it was good. And God said, let the earth bring forth grass, the herb yielding seed, and the fruit tree yielding fruit after his kind, whose seed is in itself upon the earth. And it was so. And the earth brought forth grass and herb yielding seed after his kind and the tree yielding fruit uh, whose seed was in itself after his kind. God saw that it was good in the evening and the morning were the third day. So on the third day, God finally brings forth life on this planet and he does so in the way of uh, vegetation. He plants grass he plants uh, all the different shrubs and bushes uh, that, uh, and ivies that, that fill the earth and grow all over the place. 
grow all over. Who's, who's my uh, poison ivy and poison oak people? Don't get around me with that stuff. I am bad, bad. Oh, it's awful. Bad, terrible. I'm talking like we had to, we had to get shots when me and Melissa were kids. And uh, it's funny. Mom found this old doctor. He, he had a place on Main Street. Still practicing medicine. He must have been in his 80s. Dr. Yoskett. Does that name sound familiar? And uh, he, used to, he used to tease me and tell me that it wouldn't, the shot wouldn't hurt because he used a rubber needle. And he would do that. And he said, see, it's just a rubber needle. It's just a rubber needle. I know he had big ears and a big nose, you know. And I would say, okay. And he'd stuck that in me. Ah! But anyway, we had to get shots because of the poison ivy. And uh, one time as a teenager, I had it so bad I was running a fever. I had, a, I had an infection from it. But anyway, God created all that. Thanks. And I like being in the woods. I do. I love being in the woods. I could stay in the woods all day long. The only thing is that between the ticks, the chiggers, and the poison ivy, I stay out of it. Uh, until frost... And then I go back and have, have fun. I love deer season, and that's how I'd like to spend my time. Anyway, uh, so that's what happened. Um, let's go to Matthew 13, because that's where the relevant stories are that deals with the good seed and the bad seed. Matthew chapter 13. Um, we, let's look at... Um, well, let's, let's follow the order of the scriptures. Let's look in Matthew 13, verse 3. He spake many things unto them in parables, saying, Behold, a sower went forth to sow. And when he had sowed, some, feeds, some seeds fell by the wayside, and the fowls came and devoured them up. Some fell upon stony places where they had not much earth, and forthwith they sprung up because they had no deepness of earth. And when the sun was up, they were scorched, and because they had no root, they withered away. And some fell among thorns, and the thorns sprung up and choked them. But other fell into good ground and brought forth fruit, some an hundredfold, uh, some sixty, and some thirty. Who hath ears to hear, let him hear. And the disciples came and said unto him, Why? Speakest thou unto them in parables? And he answered and said unto them, Because it is given unto you to know the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven, but to them it is not given. And now he's, he's going to explain himself here. He said, For whosoever hath uh, to him shall be given, and he shall, live, he shall have more abundance. But whosoever hath not from him shall be taken uh, away, even that he hath. Verse 13, Therefore speak I to them in parables, because they seeing see not, and hearing they hear not, neither do they understand. And in them is fulfilled the prophecy of Isaiah, which saith, By hearing ye shall hear, and shall not see, and shall, excuse me, shall not understand, and seeing ye shall see, and shall not perceive. In other words, you're going to see it, but you're not going to understand it. You're going to hear it just like everybody else hears it, but you're not, going to have a, you're not going to have a clue what it means. For this people's heart is waxed gross and their ears are dull of hearing and their eyes they have closed lest at any time they should see with their eyes and hear with their ears and should understand with their heart and should be converted and I should Heal them. Obviously, Jesus knows that there are some people that he is not going to bring healing to them. He's not going to bring salvation to them. And it's because of the hardness of their heart. Those Catholic priests in Turkana, Chris, that caused so much trouble for us, they heard what everybody else in Turkana heard. They heard what God had given me to say 
And I was saying it. But why, why didn't they, upon hearing it, say to themselves, we've never heard anything like this before. This is, this is, I can't, this is, I can't fathom this. This is, this is awesome. Uh, we need to talk to this guy. But there, that wasn't their response. Their response at first was to try to go down and complain to have me removed from the radio station. What are they going to do? Play air all day long? Um, and before that, in Samburu, before we ever went to Turkana in Samburu, they offered us a buyout. They were going to buy up the airtime from 6 a.m. to 6 p.m. And they were going to offer a huge amount of money. I hate to even say how much because it's embarrassing. But it was a huge amount of money. Every, every, every month. And I'm like, I told Michael, I said, don't tell me how much it was. Did we turn the offer down? He said, yeah. I said, okay, good. Now tell me how much they offered. And I went, oh. But then I thought about it. Mike, yeah, you, could, you would think that you could have used that money for doing good things. But you'd be selling the people that you're trying to minister to. You'd be selling them out. Yeah. And so anyway, why, why is it that these Catholic priests hear the same gospel? Huh? Tradition. Tradition. The fact that Catholic priests, by and large, are the, are the highest educated men on earth. All of them uh, have at least masters of divinity or masters of, uh, of some kind of, of uh, master program, doctor program doctor of uh, theology or whatever. They are very, very intelligent men. But they are absolutely plumb dumb. Plumb dumb when it comes to understanding and knowing the gospel. And that's because God has closed it off from their ears. Now every now and then there'll be one that God's going to save out of that. And he's going to do a mighty salvation. But bottom line is they... They hear the gospel, but it does not register with them. They still believe that praying to those idols and those images is the right thing to do. And God said no. So, uh, verse 16, But blessed are your eyes, for they see, and your ears, for they hear. For verily I say unto you, that many prophets and righteous men have desired to see those things which you see, and have not seen them, and to hear those things which ye hear, and have not heard them. Hear ye therefore the parable of the sower. And he's going to describe uh, all of that. Uh, I'm not going to go into that now, because I think we've already uh, dealt with it. Let's look in verse uh, 24. Another parable put he forth unto them, saying, The kingdom of heaven is likened unto a man which sowed good seed in his field. So we know what that is. We know that number one... Let's say that the good seed that God sowed on the earth was in the body of Adam and Eve. That Adam and Eve were created in a perfect way in the Garden of Eden. And that God offered them um, this guardianship over his, his garden that uh, God... Um, they, they would have access to all of the fruit and all the things that that garden could produce. They would have free access to all of that. All the carrots they wanted, all the celery they wanted, all the lettuce, all the corn, all the vegetables, all the grapes, the fruit, the apples. They could have everything that that garden could grow. They had it all and they had it for free. 
Now, we don't know how long Adam and Eve lived once they were joined together. We don't know how long they lived in the garden. The Bible doesn't tell us that. Um, I, I don't think anybody really knows how long that was. Um, but they had free access to everything that was in the garden. And certainly they had access to the tree of life and they ate of it and they were always living and they were always doing well and they never had any sickness or disease nor anything. So, number one, God planted good seed in the garden by way of putting Adam and Eve in the garden. They had in them the good seed of God himself speaking their DNA into existence and Adam and Eve living. Uh, but then Satan came and something that will just always stand out to me is the number of words that he speaks to Eve. 46, exactly. That's your, that's your chromosomes. That's the number of the chromosomes that you have. What was Satan doing in the Garden of Eden with Eve? He wasn't, he wasn't impregnating her the way some people believe. He, that's a storm, isn't it? Yeah, if you see lightning strike, let me know. Of course, if I see it, I'll let you know. Um, but anyway, um, there is this theory that Adam mated with uh, Eve in the garden. Don't believe that. The Bible does not teach it, doesn't speak it, does not say anything about it. Here's what we know for sure. 100% happened. He spoke. He spoke. And he spoke words to her. And poisoned her. Poisoned her mind. Poisoned her way of thinking. So that he doesn't, again, he doesn't have to tell her to eat the fruit. He's got her to a point where she's going to eat it, no matter what. So, Satan now, with his 46 words is the one who's going to plant tares into this world. So, so let's read that. Uh, verse 25, But while men slept, his enemy came and sowed tares among the wheat and went his way. When the blade was sprung up and brought forth fruit, then appeared the tares also. So the servants of the householder came and said unto him, Sir, didst thou sow good seed in thy in in thy field and from whence uh, then hath it hath it tares where did they come from and he said an enemy hath done this the servant said unto him wilt thou then that we go and gather them up but he said nay lest while ye gather up the tares ye root up also uh, the wheat with them let both Grow together. This is the world that you and I are, are living in right now. We are wheat living among tares. And to say that those tares have no effect on us, that's wrong. They do. Um, I mean, I, I just, I've given up. I've given up trying to correct people's foul mouth when I have one of my grandkids around. Um, it's the way people talk. They don't know any other way. Um, it's just the way they are. And here we are trying to, trying to impose our ways of living right for God on people who know nothing 
of living for God. We're trying to impose right living on them and say, hey, you got kids here. Can you, uh, can you change the language a little bit? Okay? Uh, all I've ever accomplished in the past is just making people mad. That's all I've done. Um, I think one guy was going to hit me. Thank God he didn't. Um, but they are tares. And they, they do have an influence on the wheat, the people who are the wheat. And let me just break this down for you so that you have understanding. The tares are every body who is lost. It's not somebody, it's not all the black people. It's not all the Japanese people or it's not all the aborigines. It's not just all of them. It doesn't, it, the person's race plays no part in that whatsoever. It is that, the, that they have chosen to live their life for Satan and follow um, his ways, his teachings, his doings. They choose that life. They choose it willfully. And one of these days, there is going to come a time when they are, and this is where we get into prophecy, there's coming a time when they, look at verse 30, let both grow together until the harvest. And in the time of harvest, I will say to the reapers, gather you together first the tares. First the tares. And bind them in bundles to burn them, but gather the wheat into my barn. So we know, according to Scripture, that all of the wicked people in this world are going to be gathered together first. We know it. We know it from here. We know it from uh, 2 Thessalonians. We know this is how it's going to happen. You can't convince some people. It's okay. I'm not worried about it. Um, I'll be just as wrong on one thing as they're just as wrong on this thing. Okay? But... The bottom line is, that's what's going to happen. The wicked people are going to be gathered together first. And then, God is going to send His angels to gather together His elect from the four winds, from one end of heaven to the other, just like in Matthew 24. Uh, that's the rapture, or the translation. They're going to be gathered together. They're referenced as the wheat in this story. And once they are gathered together, they're going to be taken and put into the, the silo of God. Amen. Silo of Jesus. And there we are going to be forever and ever. Um, it won't be as cramped as you think it will be. Okay. Be lots of room in there. So don't worry about it. But that's how it's going to happen. They're going to be gathered, bundled together. And uh, let me just tell you my little theory of how I think that's going to happen. Okay? And then we'll close. Elon Musk, uh, the guy's a genius. I will tell you, the guy's an absolute genius. Um, he looks at something like NASA trying to put rockets up in space, Musk looks at, looks at it and says, that, that design is so outdated and so outmoded. We have new fuels, we have new engines, we have new materials that NASA knows about. For some reason, they just won't think, they won't think about them. And so... It takes a visionary like that to, to look at something like as simple as a, a rocket design 
and redesign it from the bottom up and actually make it work better. Okay? When I read uh, science fiction back in my younger days, all the science fiction books talked about the rockets that would take off from the earth and then when they would come back to the earth, they all just came back down and landed softly on the earth, standing straight up, okay? But we never had any rockets that did anything like that. Not until Elon Musk. He designed a system, it's in the process of being perfected now, whereby those things come gently down to the ground and they land just like they took off, just straight up. And with every test that they run, they perfect it just a little bit more. And then eventually, they're going to have astronauts in there taking off, landing back down. And they're, they're going to have it perfected. Um, I said all that to say this. He's right about one thing. Artificial intelligence is taking over, not will take over. It's already done it. You have no idea how much of your life right now is controlled by an artificial machine and a system that operates it. You have no idea how much of your banking is controlled, how much of the car you drive, um, how, the, the data that your phone sends in to an artificial intelligence system every single day. The data that you generate, you are telling the AI everything that there is to tell about your life. And it's just getting more and more and more and more. Okay? And there, there is coming a time when all of our minds, uh, and I'm saying our in a general way, mankind, that all of mankind's brains will be linked together. Linked together. They will be one. There will be one system that rules over everybody. But they don't know that they're ruled. Because they like having their minds having this instant access to this information. They like the fact that they can watch a movie in about 30 minutes. Watch it and have it play out, a, a two and a half hour movie play out in 30 minutes. They like the fact that uh, all kinds of images can be put right into their brain. Okay, you get what I'm saying. They like all of this and they're not really aware of how much it is controlling them. But they don't care. Because it's, it's giving them God-like powers. You shall be as gods, knowing good and evil. Okay? So that day is coming. That day is coming rapidly. And I don't know when. I don't speculate. I don't, I don't do anything like that. I doubt very seriously that by this Friday night I'll have all of that and I'll know everything there is to know about AI, and I'm going to have the data, which is going to take over our brain. Don't count on that for Friday, okay? It would be pretty cool, but don't count on it. But that's, that's coming. That's a real thing, and it is going to happen. And again, without us knowing how much artificial intelligence has delved into our lives without us even knowing that. Artificial intelligence already controls and manipulates things about us. And we don't know it. We have no idea. Okay? So, get ready, people. God is, I promise you, going to spare all of us from being ruled over by this machine you don't have to search the entire internet and believe all the conspiracy theories that are out there so that you will miss out on all this don't worry about it 
If you're on God's side, God knows it. You think God's going to let you just fall right into the devil's trap? No, he won't do that. He's going to protect you from it. Okay? So fear not. Amen. Let's stand up. Fear not, nor be dismayed. Amen. Father, we ask your blessings on your word. Lord, help us, God, in, this, in these last days to see just, just how close we are to the age where the computers are taking over. Lord, we see this as a fulfillment of Bible prophecy. We believe that it is already in the works and we ask you heavenly father lord to just keep us keep us on your side keep us together keep us as your disciples and your children and lord don't let us fall for any of this garbage that's coming out in this world help us dear god to remain faithful to you You'll take care of the rest. We pray in Jesus' name. All of God's people said, Amen.